In this episode, I'm talking to Dr. Michael Murray, the author of the Encyclopedia of Natural Medicine on debunking nutrition myths and the truth about what foods are really good for you. Enjoy. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. I'm your host, Ari Witten, and today I have with me a very special guest, Dr. Michael Murray. Dr. Murray is one of the world's leading authorities on natural medicine. He's published over 30 books, 30 books, I'll repeat that, that's a lot of books, featuring natural approaches to health. He's a graduate, former faculty member, and serves on the Board of Regents of Bastyr University in Seattle, Washington, and he's the Chief Science Officer of Enzymedica. He's also the author of The Magic of Food and the Encyclopedia of Natural Medicine. So with that said, welcome to the show, Dr. Murray. Such a pleasure to have you. Likewise, it's, it's great to be here with you. Yeah. So uh, I, I want to, I was kind of debating before we started this about how I wanted to start this podcast. There's a couple good, great stuff, that, a couple great things that I wanted to get into here. Um, I'll, I'll start with one quote that I, I really like that's on your website, uh, and it says, one of the great myths about natural medicines is that they're not scientific. The fact of the matter is that for most common illnesses, there is greater support in the medical literature for a natural approach than there is for drugs or surgery. So that, that in itself is a really bold statement that would probably get you branded by, uh, you know, a lot of people in conventional medicine as, as you know, whoa, that's, this guy's crazy. Um, yeah. y- you know, and, uh, and, and yet, I, I would love for you to kind of explain what this is all about and maybe some instances where this is actually true because a lot of people in conventional medicine just say, hey, if that stuff worked, then it wouldn't be sort of alternative. It would be integrated into conventional medicine. It, you know, what, what we call anything that has science to support it is just medicine instead of alternative medicine or you know if it's not integrated in the conventional allopathic paradigm then it must be nonsense sort of thing so um can you kind of elaborate on what that quote is all about and give maybe a few examples where that's the case thank you i, I appreciate that it's a great way to start this off yeah uh, there is a, a wealth of information in the scientific literature which supports the use of natural approaches diet lifestyle modification attitude adjustments uh, deep breathing uh, other natural therapies acupuncture etc and it is a, a myth that that there's uh, little scientific support for these approaches. Uh, over the last 40 years, I've personally gathered over 70,000 scientific articles which support the use of these approaches in the treatment of disease and in the maintenance of health. And it, it just takes some common sense. I mean, uh, you, you don't get a headache because you're deficient in aspirin. You don't get depressed because you need vitamin Prozac. Uh, you don't have digestive issues because you need to take Nexium or, or Prilosec. Uh, there are underlying core factors, root causes of these situations and others. And the way we should be dealing with those underlying causes is not through suppressing symptoms, but actually promoting the body's ability to nourish and heal itself. And you know that's the, the fundamental approach that I take and I think it's just common sense and it, it is supported in the medical literature for a lot of health conditions. Take a look at something like diabetes or high blood pressure. Uh, those conditions uh, really respond very well to diet, lifestyle, uh, proper nutritional supplementation, a variety of different herbal approaches. We can make noticeable improvements in those conditions. In the case of type 2 diabetes, we can completely reverse it if we can help people improve the action of insulin throughout their body. And that can be done quite effectively in most cases. It's just that people don't know it. Uh, They've been told by the doctor, oh, you've got uh, type 2 diabetes. You're going to have to take this drug for the rest of your life, and there's no way around it. Well, that's not true. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, I'm I'm reminded as we're talking about this of this um, this kind of fascinating and also hilarious study. Um, I'm trying to find it. I think it was published in the British Journal of of Medicine. Um, 
that, that basically tried to quantify the effectiveness of statin drugs in reducing the uh, incidence of cardiovascular disease. Right. And, and you're laughing, which makes me think that you know which study I'm referring to already, but they, they quantified it and tried to compare it to the traditional sort of common sense advice of eating an apple a day, you know, sort of an apple right. a day keeps the doctor away. And they actually ended up quantifying this in a way where they, they concluded, and this was actually a real piece of research, they concluded yeah. that uh, uh, the effectiveness of a statin drug in reducing cardiovascular disease or atherosclerosis was on par with the advice to eat an apple a day. Yeah, actually the apple a day is a little bit better. Um, uh, if you look at the, the, the data is really uh, not supporting uh, the use of these statin drugs in most cases. I think they do have their use. Uh, someone who's had a heart attack has a, a, a clear clinical evidence of heart disease. Uh, yeah, th there might be some benefit that the research does support improved uh, life expectancy, but statins have not been shown to be helpful in, uh, in other cases. There's not a study that shows that it actually increases a life expectancy in women. There's no, no valid uh, study showing any, any real uh, influence on reducing mortality by taking a statin in women. And, and as I mentioned, for men, it's just restricted to those very limited uh, cases of either a prior heart attack or you know, severe cardiovascular disease. Um, if we look at the overall benefit of taking a statin from the best studies, uh, it shows a reduction in, in uh, cardiovascular death by about 28%. If we look at a study, the studies with apples, they show that eating one apple three times a week reduced the risk of having a heart attack or stroke by 37%. Yeah. Wow. And, you know, you know, you know we just, and, and then you know, one of the studies that really amazed me, I was looking through a medical journal, this is years ago, uh, there was a study, there was an ad for metformin, and it says, you know, basically to doctors, get your, your pre-diabetic patients on this drug, glucophage, because it reduces their risk of developing type 2 diabetes. And I looked at the reference, and I was familiar with the diabetes uh, prevention study, and what the study showed is they divided people into to three groups. One group uh, was the control group. The other group uh, took uh, the uh, metformin. And the third group, they instituted uh, diet and lifestyle changes. The only thing that the, the people really changed is that they were uh, walking 30 minutes a day, five days a week. So just a little bit of exercise. Okay, then they, they found that uh, compared to the control group, the people that took a statin did reduce their risk of developing type 2 diabetes by 38%, but in the people that walked 30 minutes a day for five days a week, they reduced their risk of having uh, a type 2 diabetes by 58%. So it was nearly twice as effective. And then I looked at that data, and they had information in there that looked at uh, the effects of the drug by age group, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, 50, 50 plus. And what they found was is that the drug had very little effect in people over the age of 50. And that's when most people are getting placed on these drugs. Uh, and so what they found in those patients is the drug was not effective at all at reducing the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. But again, the effect of walking persisted. So, uh, yeah, so it's just, it's, it, it, there's, there's so much uh, simple things that we can uh, apply in our lives that can make a huge difference. And uh, it's, yeah. what we don't know, what we don't know, Ari, is what happens when you combine everything. Right, uh, yeah, absolutely. And, well, you know, there's, there, and unfortunately, studies in both of those, these types of things that we're talking about. So, on the one hand, studies that, let's say, compare a drug intervention to a simple singular lifestyle invention, like going for a few walks a day or uh, you know, a few 10 minute walks a day or one 30 minute walk or something like that, or um, you know, taking a spirulina supplement as opposed to take, you know, taking statin drugs. Like, uh, yeah. Unfortunately, those studies are extraordinarily rare, almost to the point of non-existence uh, in a lot of cases. 
I, I really wish there was a lot more of that kind of study. But then as, as you're pointing out also, um, there's very few studies on comprehensive lifestyle and nutrition interventions where you just overhaul a person's diet and lifestyle. You know, if, if you consider what we mentioned before about, you know, for example, the, the diabetes drug versus a walk or the, an apple a day versus statins. If you consider some of those, how, you know, the effectiveness of a simple nutrition or lifestyle intervention, it, it only makes sense to imagine that a comprehensive nutrition and lifestyle intervention would just vastly outperform drug interventions almost every time. Ab absolutely, and uh, you know we see we see evidence uh, of, of that for sure, uh, but there's always exceptions, and so people will say, "Yeah, well, I know, I remember so and so. He did everything wrong. He ate anything he wanted, and smoked cigarettes, and drank, and he lived till he was a hundred. And right. you know, you know, I know Joe Blow, and he did everything right. He he was he died having a heart attack, running running a mile, or you know, whatever. So there's always exceptions, but when you look at a large group of people. People, we see really good trends and it's it's amazing and and uh, we just have to uh, incorporate as many of the good things in our lives that was that we possibly can and uh, uh, get it stay away from those things that aren't so good you know uh, our, our talk reminded me of another study that I thought was really interesting uh, the epic study was a European study looking at cardiovascular disease and overall health it provided a lot of really interesting studies when they they looked at, this is a study, when they looked at it in the Greek population, people that were eating a, a traditional Mediterranean diet, they found that, uh, which all, always reduces the risk of having a heart attack or stroke, but they found that when uh, people took a siesta, that it reduced their risk of having a heart attack or stroke by 67%. Oh, wow, I haven't seen that. Oh, yeah, I'll send you that study because... Uh, I, I was glad to see that because I, I've had the luxury of spending a lot of my uh, working days working at home and, and being able to take a, a 15 minute meditation or maybe a little power nap as part of my my uh, you know lifestyle and I, I like seeing that I, I got to believe I'm doing good things for myself. Yeah, well, I, I'm with you. I also work from home, and you know, uh, especially as we get into more of the fall and winter months, one of the things that I I do is in the middle of my day, I always keep that part of my day free. I never book appointments there. Uh, and the reason is I take my dog to the beach. I live, you know, walking distance to the beach here. And uh, I will take my dog to the beach here in San Diego and spend probably an hour, hour and a half um, walking her and just sitting with her on the beach and often getting a little meditation in as well or a little yeah. yoga or something like that. So it's kind of my my midday siesta too, but now I have even more reason uh, to continue doing that based on the research you just said. Yeah, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. If, if you know nutrition and physiology, you understand the importance of putting yourself in that uh, parasympathetic state, and relaxation state, and uh, uh, you know, taking that time like you're doing, what a great prescription uh, for health you're giving yourself. Yeah, and I combine it with sun exposure too. Uh, which is why that, that midday portion is kind of critical, especially during the winter months, because that's the only time you can really get it. Yeah. So one other aspect, uh, and this is an area that I, you know, as we were talking about before we started recording, that I'm really a fan of yours, and, uh, and I, I want to dig into this a bit with you. Um, you are someone that is communicating what the evidence actually says. You're someone that is committed to looking at the evidence and then you're trying to communicate to the public the truth about what the evidence says. Uh, as, I, as I said to you before, I oftentimes, unfortunately this is the case, I oftentimes feel like I'm surrounded by health gurus who are either not scientifically literate or who are just intentionally, deliberately cherry picking the evidence uh, selectively yeah. citing the studies that support their their preconceived notions and their dogmas or the you know the particular sort of diet book that they're trying to to to, to sell and make money from uh, while selectively ignoring all the evidence that conflicts and contradicts with their views uh, and and there's just way too much of that sort of nonsense going on where people are putting their dollars before truth yeah. And I, I really appreciate about your work that you do not do that, that you, that you put truth and evidence before, before dollars. And 
you know, with, with that in mind, I'd love to dig into some specific aspects of nutrition here. Um, and and uh, let's start with a very direct and blunt question um, that I know that there's no easy answer to, but based on looking at the evidence, can we say that there is one best diet for health? What is your take on that? No, uh, there, we, we are individuals and one man's poison may be another man's food. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're learning more and more what, uh, what those differentiating factors are related to, maybe our, our genetics, our genomics, and our microbiome. So we're, we're getting closer and closer to really understanding what is the best diet for a particular person. Uh, so in the meantime, all we can really do is go by some general principles. And there's, there are certain principles I think are irrefutable. A diet that is too high in refined carbohydrate, a diet that is uh, too high in the wrong types of fat and not uh, supplying uh, the right type of fat and all the other nutrients that we need is not a healthy diet. And that's the diet that most people are, are following. So when they change to a healthier diet, whether it's a, a vegan or a paleo or a keto, uh, they generally... Uh, Get, get better, uh, but you know, we have to look at what's best for the long run, and uh, there's, there's ways that we can look at that looking into the scientific literature. We can look at population-based studies where we can look and see what people were eating or are eating in an area that's associated with health and long life. We can also look at some prospective studies, and uh, there are some intervention studies with diet. And we can gain a lot of great information from that evidence. And so that's kind of what I base my uh, diet on, and, and I, I think you do as well. Yeah, absolutely. So what, uh, as far as the evidence, what, what does the evidence say about, I guess the first layer of this is the principles of, of what good nutrition for health look like, you know, sort of regardless of, let's say, the specific food choices or the mm -hmm. macronutrient ratios of the diet. What are the principles of nutrition that, that we know are good for human health and longevity? And I'll, uh, let me phrase this differently because another way of asking this, you know, in the context of what you just said, that we're all in unique individuals, is there any indication based on any evidence that eating a diet of donuts, french fries, pizza, and ice cream is the ideal bio-individualized diet for anyone? No, okay. no, for, for, for sure, yeah. Uh, the basic principles are to stay away from, from those sorts of foods and to eat a diet that's going to support blood sugar control. I think that's, uh, for most people, that's really what they're, they should be thinking about is when they're, they're, they should choose food that are going to support their, their blood sugar levels. We need to eat, a, 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 we make food choices that are low on the glycemic index and have meals that are low on the glycemic load. So that means staying away from foods that are going to quickly raise your, your blood sugar. Uh, the more processed a food is, generally the higher the glycemic index and the glycemic load. Uh, we need to eat a, a variety of uh, uh, fresh and, and, uh, and cooked uh, vegetables each day, five serving of vegetables, two serving as a fruit. Those numbers aren't just picked out of the air. Those numbers are based upon what we see in these population-based studies. If you look at the incidence of all these chronic degenerative diseases, not just cancer and diabetes and heart disease and strokes, but macular degeneration, arthritis, uh, you know, uh, Alzheimer's disease, we see that if people are able to hit that milestone, that that's where you really start seeing the preventive effects. So that's something that we should be trying to achieve each and every day. I mentioned eating the good fats and staying away from the, the bad fats. I think the good fats are the ones that we get from nuts and seeds, from good oils like olive oil, and uh, I, I, like, I like avocado oil now. I think that's, that's a great one. Uh, uh, I like uh, macadamia nut oil. I mean, coconut oil is fine. And we need those, uh, those cold water fish or uh, fish oil supplements. We need to stay away from those omega-6 fatty acids and get too much of those in our diet. So safflower, corn, uh, soy, 
uh, you need to stay away from those and, and damaged fats like trans fatty acids and, and uh, you know, some of these other man-made uh, fats. We need to stay away from those Frankenstein fats. And I think if people do that, they're going to get the right types of, of fat in their diet. Many people need to reduce their intake of meat and dairy to achieve that goal as well. Uh, so then we have to eat a high fiber diet. To me, that, that doesn't mean more muffins and uh, uh, whole grains. I think getting those from, from vegetables and legumes are, are the way to go. Um, you know, we got to get enough water each day. I think that's something that a lot of people don't think of as nutrition, but water is, is uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, we can go a while without food, but we can only go a few days without water. So it's really critical that we get good, clean water. So those yeah. are some of my basic uh, principles. I, great. So I, there's, there's even a few things there that I want to dig into that are, have become, uh, maybe uh, perhaps unfortunately, have become controversial. Um, so you mentioned, for example, uh, you know, in, in your, so with, going with deeper into the concept of fats, one of the things you write in your book is get rid of omega-6 sources like the, the ones you mentioned more, and you're not talking about nuts and seeds necessarily, you're talking about more safflower, sunflower oil, soy oil, corn oil, a lot of these sorts of um, yeah. cooking oils that have worked their way into the, the processed foods and restaurants and things like that. Um, and sometimes people's home cooking. Uh, and you talk about emphasizing olive oil, monounsaturated fat, avocados, coconut oil. So there, there's a, f actually there's one more layer to this. In your book you write, I'm curious if you still uh, are on board with this, but you said total daily fat intake shouldn't be more than 30% of calories. Um, and that's that's something you wrote in the in the magic of diet. Is that something that you're is that something you've changed your stance on at all? Because uh, obviously the the latest trends. There's a lot of people out there who are promoting mm -hmm. keto diets and saying that the best diet is one that's 60 percent or even 80 percent fat and and you know kind of crazy high fat numbers like that. Um, so and then there's one more layer to this which is the coconut oil aspect that too has become controversial right there's mm -hmm. there's some people saying hey especially in kind of vegan circles a lot of um, vegan you know diet gurus are saying hey coconut oil is a saturated fat that's also bad for us we need to avoid it the american heart association came out recently and said coconut oil is something to be wary of so what's what's your take on this whole mess of fats and how popular and kind of trending high fat intake diets have become. Yeah, I, I'm okay with it to a degree, um, but I, I had a really good discussion with an expert like yourself uh, recently. It was nice because we, we, we had a nice uh, uh, bit of, of exchange and uh, he was someone who I respected as well because he too has looked at the literature and he too, uh, Call it kind of follows a, a, a diet very similar to me. Um, again, the key thing is to eat to control blood sugar levels. And the ketogenic diet is becoming quite popular as a, as a tool to achieve that goal. Um, I think it, it has good therapeutic benefit, uh, usually as a short-term intervention. But I don't think it's really the ideal diet long-term. And, and uh, I, I think that for a, a lot of reasons. Um, one, uh, I still think that that uh, ratio that I have in the book, third no more than thirty percent. I think that's a good, I think that's a good general guideline. Uh, but as we said earlier, you know, people are different. Uh, I like to have a little bit of a dashboard for my nutritional uh, uh, life. I I use a body fat uh, scale that measures my body weight, my body fat, my muscle. Uh, content, my visceral fat, and my water content. And I, I, I can see what effect different uh, ratios have and what effect intermittent fasting has or with time of meals and uh, lots of different things. I can see what the impact is uh, on my, my body fat percentage. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm most concerned about because I think that there's a, you know, we, we, we think about body weight, but it's really not body weight. It's our percentage of the body fat that I think we want to keep under control. As we age, we lose muscle, we uh, gain fat. Uh, I think there's a relationship to accelerating 
uh, the aging process and, you know, putting more fat on and losing more muscle. So uh, at age 60, I'm very motivated to maintain muscle mass and keep my body fat percentage at or, you know, hopefully uh, uh, slightly trending downward to what it is right now. Uh, so I find that for me, uh, that ratio still works. Now, um, I th also think it's important to get uh, the calories from where I think the diet should primarily consist of, and that is um, the uh, vegetables. And, uh, you know, vegetables are, are tend to be very low in, in fat. And so we, th those should be the primary uh, components of our diet, uh, along with, you know, the good oils and, and high-quality protein. We need those vegetables because they provide all these different health-promoting phytochemicals, plant-based chemicals that act as antioxidants or enhance our detoxification mechanisms and feed our microbiome. Uh, fats are important in feeding our microbiome, but what we're learning is that it's not just the prebiotic fibers that are in the, the vegetables and fruit and legumes that are so helpful but they also contain these phytochemicals that uh, are critical to the health of the microbiome. Uh, there's a big focus in research right now. It's fun, isn't it, to see what they're discovering about how food and diet impacts this microbiome. And there are certain things that we're learning. And one of the things that we're learning is that what's important is to have a, a microbiome that has great diversity. What determines our diversity in our microbiome is the diversity in our diet. Most Americans eat the same foods over and over and over again. And that's, what hap that's another thing that happens on a ketogenic diet. People start eating the same foods over and over again. And a lot of times they start eating uh, you know, too much, I think, animal fats. And, and, uh, you, know, we, we, you can get a lot of fat from avocados and nuts and seeds and whatnot. But, um, I think people end up uh, moving over and getting a lot of fat from, from animal foods. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think... Do you, mind if I, do you mind if I interrupt oh. you on one point related to the microbiome and diversity? Yeah. There, there's one aspect of this as sort of the concept of the microbiome yeah. is becoming better known and the role in health is becoming better known. And we have these companies like Ubiome and Viome that are sort of microbiome testing companies that are emerging. Um, there's, there's one really big misconception that I feel a lot of people have right now as this is happening, which is a lot of people are kind of now thinking in the mindset that, oh, I need to get my microbiome tested and find out my unique microbiome, and then I need to be prescribed a specific diet that is the right diet that I need to eat sort of for the rest of my life based on my unique bio-individual uh, bio sort of my unique microbiome. Um, and, and I just want to point out that that sort of thinking is actually reversed from the thinking that you're talking about, which is the diversity in the diet determines how healthy and how diverse your microbiome is, which in turn, you know, influences how healthy you are. So it, people just kind of are, have this thought process reversed. Like I need to find out my microbiome and then eat a very specific diet that facilitates my microbiome, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know you biome and what their dietary recommendations are. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm familiar with Viome, and they they've discovered a lot of interesting things. Uh, and I think the goal with with their recommendations is to move people into a healthier uh, microbiome. But we're just scratching the surface on our knowledge, but there are some, some things that we do know, and diversity and richness is very, very important. And the way that we support that is to have a diet that is diverse and rich in these phytochemicals. Um, so that's, that's why I haven't really changed much uh, in my uh, composition of, of the diet in terms of the calorie allo allocation. Because you, if you load up on, on fats, it's going to reduce. And to be a, a true ketogenic diet, your intake of fat has to be about 80% of your calories. You can't really have much protein, and you can't really have much, uh, much carbohydrate, even if it's good carbohydrate. 
Um, again, I think that's there's there's uh, applications of that therapeutic diet for sure. Uh, no question about it. Uh, maybe helpful as a kickstart for someone for a weight loss program or to help them get control of their blood sugar. But I think long term we can achieve that same benefit by eating a low glycemic load diet. Mm -hmm. So there are a few other uh, points of contention here. Yeah, coconut oil is one. There even meat is now one. I mean, there's there's just a wide variety of perspectives on on meat. With a lot of yeah. meat diet gurus saying, you know, meat is sort of unequivocally linked to disease and and lowered mortality. And then we have you know a, a lot of people kind of pointing to evidence that omnivory inclusion of of meat can lead to just as good of outcomes. Uh, and dairy and um, legumes, even. Uh, oh, great. With, uh, you're, you're, you're hitting all the... <laughs> with the, the anti-lectin stuff, Dr. Gundry's stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, demonizing lectins. Le uh, legumes are obviously a, a big part of your dietary recommendations. And, yeah. you know, there's a huge body of evidence linking them to improved health outcomes. And yet we have some people swearing that legumes are driving disease. So... I, I'll, I'll let you kind of address which specific points there that, that you think are the most relevant or are worthy of addressing. If we look at population-based studies and we look at areas like blue zones where people live a longer and healthier life, we see that legumes are a common component of most of these uh, blue zone areas. So uh, I'm not uh, sure why people are saying to stay away from them. The, and then the whole idea of the lectin issue. Uh, lectins are these uh, plant proteins that uh, are destroyed by cooking. Nobody's eating raw kidney beans, so I don't understand why there's a, a big concern about, about lectins. And there's no data that shows that these lectins are, are absorbed into our, our, into our body and, and produce any harm at all. Uh, so I think it's a, a bit uh, flimsy, uh, the recommendation to stay away from what I consider a a health building uh, food. I, I think there's a lot of great benefits to uh, a legume diet, particularly in people that have blood sugar issues. Uh, they lower cholesterol levels as well. They're very good for uh, your kidneys and elimination. So there's a lot of good reasons for including legumes in your diet on a regular basis, in, in, in my opinion. And I think the, the literature supports that. Yeah. Coconut oil. I think coconut oil is a good fat. I think that like a lot of our foods, uh, they've been, uh, some things have been blown out of proportion. Uh, for example, uh, what the research shows is that if you substitute coconut oil for butter or other saturated fat in the diet, that people actually uh, will lose weight. Uh, now, that has been translated to is, oh, if you add coconut oil to your diet, you're going to lose weight. And so, you know, I remember when this first came out, I had patients, they were saying, I don't understand. I'm add, adding coconut uh, and uh, I'm gaining weight because they're like most Americans. They add a little bit. It's not working. So they add a little bit more and, you know, they're adding more and more calories to their diet. And as a result, uh, yeah, they, they started gaining weight. So uh, in terms of its effects on the heart, I think there uh, is differences between the uh, saturated fats that we get in coconut oil, these medium chain triglycerides, versus the saturated fats that we get from meat and other products, which even then we, we can, we can kind of challenge some of the, the concern there. Uh, I personally haven't eaten much uh, red meat in the last uh, 40 years. Uh, and I, I, that's based on a few things. Uh, for me, you know, when I look at the meat supply now in 2018, it's much better than it's probably been in, in for many, many years. We have more uh, grass-fed and, and pasture-raised animal products out there. I think that's really important. Uh, this is a little segue, but I think you'll find it really interesting. I think the greatest threat to human health uh, right now is not some super bug or eating too much sugar. I think the biggest threat is this ever increasing load of environmental pollutants, pesticides, herbicides, flame retardants, etc. Uh, there was a study that was done in 2006. It was based on the uh, National Nutrition Survey and 
they actually uh, had blood measurements of uh, pesticides and herbicides, and they found that when they divided people into exposure levels based on their blood levels of these persistent organic pollutants, that you could make a stronger case that obesity and type 2 diabetes had more to do with persistent organic pollutants than it did for uh, eating too much sugar or any other dietary factor. Okay, so what they found was is that it, they divided people by exposure to pesticides and uh, also by body weight. And they found that a person that was uh, obese, if they had high levels of these pesticides, they had a 40 times greater risk of developing type 2 diabetes than those that had little or none of those, those pesticides. Yeah. And even someone who had an ideal body weight, if they were at the highest level of exposure, they were 20 times more likely to develop type 2 diabetes than someone who was morbidly obese. Yeah, the numbers are amazing. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I look at that and then I see all the comorbidities with the obesity and type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, for example, and it really starts making a, a lot of sense. When they looked at where these people were getting their pesticide load from, it wasn't from eating vegetables. What people don't realize is that the higher you go up on the food chain, the more concentrated these contaminants become. So we're always concerned about, you know, the dirty dozen and uh, uh, eating organic produce, but what is probably more important is eating clean, as clean as possible sources of meat and dairy. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, th that's been one of the reasons why I, I've stayed away from, from those foods, because I, you're more likely to have higher concentration of, of contaminants that our body doesn't uh, respond well to. They're hard for our body to get rid of. That's why they're called persistent organic pollutants. Yeah. Um, I, I'm debating whether we should stay to nutrition or go into the, into the toxin stuff right now. But um, I have one more question on this, this red meat aspect of things. I don't know if you've seen the, the latest diet trend, which is the carnivore diet. Yes. I, yeah. And, I, you know, I, I follow a guy on Instagram. I love him, and he posts great information and, you know, before and after pictures, and uh, people are leaning out, and they look like they're in great shape. And uh, I, just, I just don't think – I think uh, – here's what the literature shows with kidney stones. They, they found that if someone ate a lot of meat uh, – if they ate a lot of vegetables, they didn't get kidney stones. But if they ate a lot of meat and didn't eat any vegetables, uh, they, they got kidney stones. So meat in, it wasn't the meat intake, it was the absence of vegetables really that determined whether they would get kidney stones or not. And I think that uh, they may be you know, kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul, uh, but the, the uh, bottom line is that in the long run, they may uh, be ending up not getting something that their 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 body needs, and I, I really believe that uh, we need these. I, we're, we're hunter gatherers, you know. We're not just hunters, uh, but uh, I, I do think there's individual variation, uh, and and I don't know. I don't think it's uh, solely due to blood type. That I think, but it is due to kind of how we're made, and some of us may do better on a higher. Uh, meat-based diet. Just make sure it's it's clean meat. Um, for me, uh, I, I'm pretty happy with with where I am. I get my protein. I like whey protein. Uh, I've looked at the different types, and um, again, I kind of see how my body feels and how uh, I, I see my my uh, retention of muscle. And I do really well with with uh, uh, utilizing whey protein in in smoothies. I like, uh, I, I have an, org if, my, if I have eggs, I have one organic egg, uh, and then I have a, a, a supplement it with egg whites if I'm making an omelet or a scramble. I think scrambles are great. Uh, I'm a big fan of, of really spicing up your meals, uh, adding spices and herbs, because these are concentrated sources of these valuable phytochemicals that we talk a lot about in foods. Uh, these are gifts. These are ways that we can really uh, take advantage of getting really high concentrations of really active compounds from food. And so, you know, take advantage of it. It's been great. Uh, 
I love some of the changes that have happened in our food supply. Uh, it's, it's so much easier to eat super healthy and to make uh, choices. Uh, for example, uh, you know, we now ha we have a lot of fresh herbs now in, in, the, in the stores. Years ago, we just had, you know, maybe parsley or basil if you were lucky. Uh, I've fallen in love with these microgreens. I'm, in San Diego, you've got to have those. Uh, you know, instead of getting uh, these lettuces and, you know, arugula and uh, even kale and, and uh, all these other green leafy vegetables with a lot of leaf and not a lot of nutrients, we can get these microgreens that taste better and I think are, are more nutritious. So, I mean, they're, they're, they're just, there's just a lot of choices and availability now to, to, to choose healthier forms. Yeah, absolutely. And I, this is a nice segue. I want to get into to phytochemicals with you. So one of the really interesting things, and I, I don't know if you've delved much into the research on this subject. This is a, a big passion of mine. Um, I'm fascinated with the science of phytochemicals. And one of the, the really interesting things to me is this pervasive myth and misconception around phytochemicals that they are quote unquote antioxidants. And uh, basically the research around them as um, what are called xenohormetans or xenohormetic phytochemicals. Right. Actually, they're, they're not actually acting as direct antioxidants in most cases. They are, in many cases, actually acting as pro-oxidants, which we would think intuitively is a bad thing if antioxidants are good and pro-oxidants are bad. Um, and yet, they're associated with all of these remarkable health benefits. So um, is this something that, you, are you familiar with the research on this topic? Yeah, yeah. Of so I would love for you to explain how that all works and, um, and, and kind of the mechanisms and some of the misconceptions that people have. Uh, well, uh, first of all, our, our body is incredible and nature is incredible. And in this day and age, I think we've, we've all fallen in love with, with, uh, with technology. I mean, it's amazing what we can do with these and what we're doing right now, uh, being able to talk to each other. But uh, the, the greatest uh, technology in the universe is nothing that man has created. Uh, the greatest technology in the universe is, is nature. And uh, we talked about my latest book, The Magic of Food. I named it that because uh, Sir Arthur Clarke, who wrote 2001, A Space Odyssey, said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Mm. And I just told you that nature is the greatest technology in the universe. Well, it's through food that we commune with nature on a daily basis. And what makes food really magical are these phytochemicals. Uh, these compounds are really interesting. And yeah, we can talk about their benefits to us as humans eating them, but they're really designed to protect the plant or perform plant functions. And uh, yeah, some of them were designed so that we wouldn't eat the plant, some of these, uh, these compounds. And we have in our body an incredible protective mechanism to allow these plant compounds to be utilized in areas of need when they're needed. Uh, for example, everyone's probably heard of curcumin, the yellow pigment from turmeric. Uh, all of these uh, compounds like curcumin, these, these uh, polyphenolics and phenolic compounds, when we ingest them, they, get, they end up getting bound to a glucuronic acid so they float around in our body in an inactive form. And so you say, well, what's, what's the sense of that? Well, uh, these are pharmacologically active compounds. If, if we didn't have a protective mechanism, every time we ate something, even something as simple as an apple, we'd be taking in all these drug-like compounds and it would over, overwhelm our physiology, it would cause chaos. So nature built in so that we would have uh, this protective mechanism. So for example, curcumin, it's an anti-inflammatory and an anti-cancer compound. It has multiple uh, mechanisms of action. We know that based upon test tube studies, and then we know that it has some effects in animals and in, in clinical studies as well. What's interesting is that when it's floating around in our body, it's floating around in this bound form and it's not active. But at sites of inflammation or where there's cancer activity, then the, the cells uh, secrete an enzyme called beta-glucuronidase. And this enzyme will break that bond, free up that 
curcumin and deliver it to the cell so it can exert its anti-cancer, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory uh, uh, effects. And uh, I just think that's really beautiful. It just shows the harmony of nature. And I know that you're passionate about phytochemicals because it's addictive because you start looking at, at how they work and you're like, oh my God, this is a beautiful symphony. Mm -hmm. we, yeah, you want to, and for me, it really inspires me to, to eat more of them in my diet. And that's what I tried to uh, get across in my book. I think, uh, you know, my goal was if people understood the magic of what uh, these foods do, they're going to make healthier choices. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, as far as uh, the, the hormesis and some of the other uh, thoughts on this and, you know, are they really pro-oxidants or antioxidants, um, some of that goes away when you start looking at how these compounds are metabolized. For, for example, everybody's probably heard that, uh, you know, blueberries are a brain food. Uh, uh, one of the interesting studies that I, I reviewed recently, they fed blueberries to, to adolescents and they found that it made them happier. One serving. Just feeding blueberries to these kids uh, made them score happier on mood indexes. Uh, now, uh, anyone who's ever had a, a teenager, this is valuable information because you want them to be to be to be happier. Uh, so, how are the blueberries exerting this effect? Well, it, it turns out that these uh, beneficial compounds. Uh, more likely are broken down into other compounds that are then broken down by not our digestive secretions, but by the microbiome and transformed into other compounds that are able to get across the blood-brain barrier, change blood flow, and also influence neurotransmitter effects. So uh, just really, really, uh, you know, very interesting. And it's, it's really cool. What controls our digestive uh, functions to a large extent is the vagus nerve. This is one of the largest nerves in the body. And what, what's interesting about the, the vagus nerve is that 80% of the transmissions are from the gut to the brain, and 20% are the other way around. So uh, what, is it, what they theorize is happening is that there's this communication between uh, the microbiome, our intestinal organs, and our brain. That's where that mind, uh, brain, and, uh, and gut connection comes from. It comes, it's a two-way connection, but most of the incoming information is, is coming from the gut. So when people talk about a gut feeling, that's, that's true. And uh, again, that's why I think it's so important to take advantage of, of, of phytochemicals, because I think they are the fuel of the of the the gut brain axis and I, i'm sure that's what you feel as well yeah yeah absolutely i i think um you know, there's so many thoughts rushing through my head of avenues we could go from here but um you know you reminded me of one study on pomegranates that i saw recently where they yeah. showed that uh specific microbes in the intestines um, actually transformed a specific compound from the pomegranates, a specific chemical, phytochemical, that um, into another compound that then entered the bloodstream and had these profound effects on mitochondria, the profound benefits to mitochondria. But, you know, going back to what you were talking about earlier with the microbiome, if somebody doesn't have the proper diversity in their microbiome, they may not even have that bacteria or a significant amounts of that bacteria to transform that chemical from pomegranate into the right chemical that's then going to benefit the mitochondria. So there's this very unique interaction now between phytochemicals and the microbiome and the chemicals that are then produced, which then can impact the body or not, maybe depending right. on that person's diversity of their microbiome. I, I'm going to talk a little bit about gluten really quick Please. as it relates to the, to the microbiome because it's really interesting. Um, so uh, what we've learned, there's been an explosion of, of information on the microbiome because there's improved analytical methods to know what's really going on down there. And we've discovered that there are many important uh, gut bacteria. One of the most important uh, bacteria is Acromantia mucinophila. And this bacteria, it's given that name mucinophila because it loves the mucin layer and it works along with the 
cells that line the intestinal tract to produce that protective mucin layer. And uh, if someone is not getting enough uh, food for that acromancia mucinophilia, then it's, it's going to mean that you're going to have a breakdown in that protective mucus. So again, I think uh, not getting enough vegetables and, and uh, legumes and, and whole grains on occasion, uh, you're going to have lower levels of that uh, bacteria. And eating a, 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 a carnivore-only diet, I think, is going to put you at risk for, for that happening. So with lower levels of acromancia mucinophilia, we start exposing our intestinal lining to a harsh environment and it gets damaged and we get the leaky gut and all the consequences there. So when you're looking at gluten sensitivity, uh, that's a, a, an immune mediated situation. We see that it only affects, you know, maybe five to 10% of the population, but we see uh, all these people saying, oh boy, I go on a gluten-free diet, I feel better. Now, some of that may be be placebo, but I also think a lot of that is real because it turns out that gluten is very toxic to this bacteria. So uh, if someone has a really flourishing amount of acromancia mucinophilia in their, in, uh, in their microbiome, they can withstand gluten. But if someone has lower levels and they have a bit of gluten, then that can wipe out that beneficial bacteria and exposed to the the the, uh, the intestinal lining that harsh environment uh, so uh, I think that's why we're seeing so much uh, of an issue with gluten I also think that uh, wheat is one of the most heavily sprayed foods so I think some of the detrimental effects are related to glyphosate glyphosate these pesticides they're antibiotics so they are extremely destructive to the microbiome. Many drugs are extremely detrimental. So, you know, we got uh, all these people that are on proton pump inhibitors, Nexium and Prilosec, for example, very uh, destructive to the microbiome. They start eating a lot of gluten or eating gluten, uh, they're, they're going to, they, they could uh, see, uh, be more sensitive to the to the ill effects of gluten. So I do think that it goes beyond an immune me mediated effect, and it's probably mediated through uh, the microbiome. I, I have one more follow up question to that um, to play devil's advocate a little bit, yeah. which is that as you know, there's also at the same time as you know maybe these mechanisms that you're talking about are going on. There's also this body of evidence showing that whole grain consumption, certainly not refined grain consumption. Right. But whole grain consumption is, is pretty unequivocally linked with health benefits for a variety of different mm -hmm. diseases, as well as just sort of it's associated with, uh, with, with longevity in general. So how do you kind of um, make sense of those, those two things, kind of the mechanisms you're talking about as well as the research? Yeah, I think there's some benefits with, with whole grains consumptions. And, and, you know, when I'm talking, um, I try to envision who I'm talking to. And I don't know your audience all that well, but the general audience, we, we've got a problem with obesity and type 2 diabetes. And uh, so if you look at that Mediterranean diet pyramid, I just cross off bread, pasta, and, and grains. Uh, I, th I think those foods made a lot of sense when we really needed a lot of calories. Yeah. Um, but we only have uh, so many calories that we can consume in a day healthfully. I, I kind of weigh uh, the, the health benefits that we get from the different foods. And grains are really a great source of easily absorbed calories, uh, you know, starches in general. Um, I'd rather spend those calories or consume those calories from richer sources. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm with you on that, I, I, and I, I say that as someone who uh, eats brown rice in my diet and and um, quinoa sometimes, yeah. and uh, and also even some sourdough bread every now and then. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm not a hardcore anti-grain person, but I completely agree that they are kind of a very rich source of calories relative to not that much nutrients. Uh, yeah, and I don't know if you're like me, but I'm very aware of, of uh, the the glycemic load of a meal. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, I try to, when I'm working with people uh, in diabetes and weight loss and just general health, I try to help them have a working knowledge of what is the glycemic load. So uh, ideally, I like to consume a glycemic load no greater than 20 for any two and a half to three hour period. So 
with it, with that limitation, uh, if you have a cup of, of white rice, you're wiped out. If you have a banana, you're wiped out for three hours. No more carbohydrates. Uh, uh, brown rice, you can have two thirds of a cup and uh, some steamed vegetables, uh, sautéed vegetables, and still be still be okay. So uh, you know, uh, if you're going to eat grains, make it make it whole and keep the portion size uh, moderate. Uh, that's that's my message. Um, uh, that said, uh, if I have a choice of, of eating uh, uh, some some uh, some brown rice with my meal or having a piece of dark chocolate at the end of my meal, I tend to eat the dark chocolate at the end of my meal. <laughs> Cool. So I, I want to come back to my, my favorite topic, which is phytochemicals. And I want to, my, my final question or a couple questions to you is on a very practical level, what are your favorite superfoods and uh, super spices? Ah, very good. Yeah. Uh, I try to eat a very high intake of flavonoids. Uh, I, I like phytochemicals as well. Flavonoids, I think, are the most fascinating these are the compounds that give many uh, fruit, uh, flowers, medicinal herbs, and, and uh, vegetables their color. There are about 8,000 flavonoids that have been identified. Uh, and what's interesting is that our body will concentrate different flavonoids in different tissues. And what also is interesting is that deposition pattern often mirrors the historical use of the, the, the fruit or medicinal plant. So, for example, milk thistle gets concentrated in the liver. Uh, bilberry gets concentrated in the retina, in the, in the, in the veins. Uh, ginkgo gets concentrated in the brain and in the adrenal. So it's really interesting when they radio label these flavonoids that their deposition mirrors their historical use. I think that's really interesting. How did they know? Mm -hmm. um, so I try to get a really good intake of flavonoids on a, on a daily basis. I mentioned dark chocolate. I generally have uh, one ounce of uh, dark chocolate a day. That's, that's a good amount. I like uh, you know, 80, 82, 86, 92%. Uh, uh, I, I think anything uh, lower than 82%, you're gonna, get, uh, you're gonna get some sugar. And again, I, I, uh, I think you develop a, 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 a taste for the chocolate and like the bitterness. And, and uh, so uh, you may need to start at 70, 75, but keep working your way up. Uh, you'll, your, your health will be, be better. Uh, berries, I try to eat berries uh, every day, and I mix it up. I don't eat the same berry every day. Again, you want to have diversity in, in your diet. So I think berries and flavonoid-rich foods, green tea, uh, they are true superfoods. Um, it doesn't have to be something exotic to get those flavonoids. We talk about it, an apple, an apple a day is not a bad thing. I'd, I'd say three time, three a week is a good thing because that's where we start seeing those those benefits. Yeah, even um, um, you know, I'll mention another really non-exotic one. It's lemons or <laughs> lemons, lemon peel. You know, I have a lemon tree yeah. growing in my backyard. Yeah. That's, my my yard before I moved into this house was totally neglected and there's this, this lemon tree that was out there that was kind of like half dead but has been alive for 30 years and it's producing these huge lemons now that we water it and if you look at the the research on um, just the phytochemicals in lemons and you look at things like hesperidin and rutin and d-limonene and there's yeah. some really amazing phytochemicals that have remarkable benefits just in a lemon. Yeah, the, the, the anti-cancer benefits, the detoxification benefits, uh, these volatile oils, uh, we have to have them in our, in our diet. Uh, so you talk about, you know, kind of super herbs. We, you know, I could go to the, the standard ones, ginger and turmeric and, and uh, you know, capsicum. But I really like the aromatic ones, the, the mints, the basil and oregano, rosemary. Uh, they're fantastic. And Here's an interesting thing. Uh, there's really interesting research coming out of the animal feed uh, research because what they're trying to do is they're trying to get away from uh, hormones and antibiotics. And so they're looking to nature. So they're seeing what effects you know, feeding these animals cinnamon has, uh, feeding them oregano and, and thyme and sage. Mm. It's very interesting. They're, they're seeing... Uh, not only uh, beneficial effects on the microbiome, but they, they, they help the animals 
a digestive process, uh, the digestive enzymes, the assimilation of nutrients, so they grow healthier. And they, if they, they're healthier and they're growing well, they don't have to use the antibiotics or steroids. So uh, I, I love, I love uh, these, these volatile herbs. And dill is another one. And, uh, you know, there's different ways uh, to, to utilize them. I prefer them in their fresh form. I think it just tastes more vibrant. And I mentioned scrambles. I'll, I'll rotate uh, different herbs. Like, you know, I think uh, uh, scrambled eggs and egg whites uh, with dill uh, on them is just really, really great tasting. And, you know, same thing with basil or oregano or rosemary or thyme. You know, so I have a little uh, coffee grinder that I uh, uh, grind these fresh herbs and, and, and put them on. Uh, Pesto. I found this great pesto at uh, at the at the health food store. It doesn't have any Parmesan cheese in it. It has cashews in it. And mm. it, oh, man, I tell you, that is that is health in a, in a jar. You know, I spread yeah, that on. Now, now you're speaking my language. I, I actually, for whatever reason, I've never liked the taste of dill very much. Yeah. Um, but uh, much to you know, my my wife actually finds it <laughs> totally bizarre because she loves dill. Uh, but uh, basil, I go nuts for basil. I ask her to make me like huge things of, of homemade basil, like huge jars of it, and I just scoop so much of that stuff on my food. It's kind of ridiculous. You know, it's, it, I got to tell, throw a, a funny, uh, funny uh, story here. Um, you know, there's some people that react to cilantro, and uh, yeah. there's twenty percent of people that eat uh, cilantro. They swear it tastes like stink bug. And uh, so, I heard, yeah, I heard it's soap. Don't some people say it's yeah. like soap? Yes, a soapy uh, taste, and uh, uh, I, I just couldn't understand it. Uh, this was the, uh, many years ago, uh, but uh, this woman was just saying, "Oh, I don't like uh, that has cilantro in it," and because she knew she could just she knew if, it, if something had cilantro, and she described to me that this that she had this uh, it had this effect. And she said, "No, some people have this. This, this is what it tastes like to some people." And I didn't believe her, and uh, sure enough, she she was absolutely right. So, I, I, I that that's really interesting too. Uh, uh, it, it, there, it, and then the way some people metabolize asparagus, uh, they they don't smell it in their urine. Uh, they don't. They lack the enzyme that'll break it down into the asparaginase. So. Uh, Anyway, that's I think I think it's interesting. Again, it goes back to we're all a, a bit different. I don't know why you don't like like dill. I don't know either. <laughs> but <laughs> but I love be, pesto. I'll tell you that. Yeah, there's got to be a reason for it, right? And yeah. I think I think you got to trust it. Uh, I know we're coming at the end of time, but I, I want to just inter interject one of the most famous studies in in nutrition. Um, it was a study that was published in the Journal of American Medical Association in 2006, and they looked at uh, they looked at caffeine intake and the risk of having a heart attack or stroke, and they broke people down into whether they were a fast metabolizer or a slow metabolizer. Uh, if someone was a fast metabolizer and they drank two to four cups of coffee a day, they would reduce their risk of having a heart attack or stroke by 47%. So for those people, it was beneficial. If someone was a slow metabolizer of caffeine and they drank two to four cups of coffee a day, they actually increased their risk of having a heart attack or stroke by 247 percent. Wow. So what, what's the difference? It's not the food, it's not the beverage, it's how that person metabolizes it. and that's the future of nutrition and that's why there's no one diet that fits all and we're learning uh, more and more what works for one person and the other and for now people just have to kind of trust and develop a sensitivity and use their, their common sense and work with a professional that can help them uh, know if they're eating what's right for them. Yeah, yeah, beautifully said. And uh, on that note, I think that's a really great segue to your summit, which is happening right now. I'm going to rush this podcast to get out uh, this weekend, and it's the Healing Power of Food Summit. Uh, we will have a link to it on the page where we're going to publish this podcast and we can set up, we'll set up that page as theenergyblueprint.com forward slash healing dash foods. So the energy, the energy blueprint.com forward slash healing dash foods. And then there's a link to sign up for your summit 
for free, correct? Correct. It's free. And we, we have uh, 30 uh, top experts talking about a wide variety of topics, uh, different opinions. I know some, some summits, they, they bring everybody that's singing the same song. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I didn't do that. I brought people that, uh, you know, talking about uh, their, their uh, philosophy and why they think uh, vegan is the way to go. Next person talking uh, paleo and keto and then we have pescatarians and you know we, we have a, a variety of people talk on a, a number of different subjects uh it was it was truly an honor and i appreciate your support of the summit yeah my pleasure and uh you know going back to something i said earlier i just want to re-emphasize you know in, in a world filled with nutrition gurus who are misrepresenting and cherry picking the evidence i really appreciate your honest intellectually honest uh, take on the evidence and your desire to communicate the truth uh, instead of doing this sort of traditional marketing ploy of, hey, here's my brand new diet and here's the new list of good foods and bad foods and here's how to lose 20 pounds in the next 15 days. And, you know, with, with my new magical diet, I, I really appreciate your honesty and commitment to the truth and the evidence. So, uh, and integrity, most of all. So uh, I highly recommend everybody to follow your work, to sign up for your summit. I give that endorsement to very, very few people when it comes to nutrition, uh, that this is someone that I truly believe is, is communicating the evidence accurately. Um, highly recommend people to sign up for the summit. Again, you can get it at theenergyblueprint.com forward slash healing dash foods. And thank you so much, Dr. Murray. It's been an absolute pleasure to have this conversation with you. And I, I really, truly hope that we can do this again because yeah. you know, we didn't even get into the toxins issue. Even within the realm of nutrition, I'm sure we could talk for 10 more hours on lots of different things. So this has been a blast. Thank you so much. Oh, it's been great fun for me. And I just will say that uh, I really appreciate your enthusiasm. And there's, there's very deep understanding and knowledge uh, uh, coming through you. And uh, I, I applaud everyone that follows you as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, like seriously, been an absolute pleasure. And I, I really look forward to, to part two. Very good. Thanks so much, Dr. Murray. Have a great Thank day. You. Hey there, this is Ari again. One more quick thing before you go. Just make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Energy Blueprint, and also make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or anything else. I hope you guys enjoyed this interview, and I will see you again next week.